Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Sanderson, co-director of the Transnational Threats Project here at CSIS. Welcome. Uh, for those of you first time in our building, uh, welcome to our new uh, place for superb meetings and gatherings of all sorts. Uh, we have emergency exits up the staircase, and also on the left there, there are two exits, emergency exits, two doors that go out to the alleyway, um, in case anything... Uh, okay, absolutely. I'll lead. I'll lead right behind these two. Um, anyways, uh, when you speak this morning, please make sure you use your microphone because we are webcasting the event. Um, we are in the process of hosting a series of events coming out of our work on the Middle East and North Africa region. For the past three years, we've been conducting a three-phase study called Militancy and the Arc of Instability, looking at South Asia, completed about three years ago, the Middle East and North Africa, which we completed with our co-directors from the Middle East program here. And we're doing a spin-off from that study now, looking at foreign fighters in the region. And phase three, which will be with our Africa team, some of whom are here today will be on Africa's Sahel and also with a strong connection to Libya, which is one of the reasons why we are having today's discussion. Not only because Libya is in a state of chaos right now, but because as we look at the African Sahel and the militant groups and the trafficking that goes on there and the general instability, we know there's a direct connection to Libya for this. So we want to begin examining that. We will have more events on this over the next few months, so please stay tuned for that. We'll have a visitor from the White House come over from the National Security Council to discuss the Levant. We'll have uh, former intelligence officials and diplomats come in to discuss Libya again. Um, but right now, we have Najla Mangush and Hunter Keith to discuss this. They have superb experience in Libya and in the region, generally speaking. Hunter is in uh, Jordan and Libya and Egypt for many years. and. Uh, with the Office of Transition Initiatives, and then more recently with Development Alternatives in Libya. And Najla is from Benghazi, correct? Okay. And has been, uh, spent most of her life there, as well as the UK, and now is in school in the United States. And I'll leave it to them to add any other um, points of interest about their background. But I've been impressed uh, with my uh, last few months with hunters. We've gotten to know each other. Uh, through some work, and, and I can tell you very high value input that you'll hear today. And Najla, being from Libya um, and given her academic background, is likely to provide just as good a content. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. So we'll have Hunter go first for 10 or so minutes, then Najla will go. And I think we have some slides for Najla. And then I'll have a series of questions, then we'll open it up. Please identify yourself and your organization and any relevant background, and please make the questions brief, uh, or the statement very, very brief. I know people just can't avoid making a statement, but uh, please uh, please keep all of that brief because we have uh, now about 80 minutes to go. So with that, I'll turn it over to Hunter. Hunter, thank you very much for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, perfect. Um, let me start by just saying a couple of things. Uh, First, on the on the positive, um, I want to uh, say how appreciative I am for the the uh, collegial relationship that I've had with uh, Mr. Sanderson and his whole team here at CSIS. It's been a remarkable uh, six months of activity uh, since I started uh, participating back in October, and and I I just think the world of the of the work that the organization is doing. Um, I also want to say how uh, honored I feel to be here with Najla Mangush, who is an old friend of mine from Benghazi. Uh, Najla has done <laughs> that was that, that was a terrible way to phrase that. Uh, Najla has done extraordinary things uh, for for her country, uh, for her city, and um, now she's doing extraordinary things, I think, for herself and for her family here in the United States. And it's wonderful that she's been able to come with her two uh, lovely daughters to, um, to uh, contribute academically and, um, uh, at, the, at the university where she's studying here in Virginia. Um, the slightly less positive thing that I'll say at the outset is that um, I, I'm motivated these days uh, in, in what I what I would call a continuing interest in Libya, although I, I left the country about this time last year and, and ceased being a resident. Uh, but I'm motivated these days by what I think is an appalling 
lack of specificity uh, when it comes to our identification and discussion of those groups in the country that have a meaningful impact on its future. Um, and also an appalling lack of discernment when it comes to the motivations that those groups have and those individuals have uh, as they uh, compete for influence uh, and other, other kinds of resources. Um, w there needs to be a much, uh, a much better, I think, discussion of how exactly Libya has been evolving over the last three years and how it will continue to evolve in the near future. I'm not sure that I can give um, every answer today about the, the, the exact profile of different actors and groups today in the country because I do think that uh, one's distance from the country hinders one from, from making those kinds of judgments and descriptions, but I'll, I'll do my best and I'm sure Nudgela will do much better. Um, but they're, they're, I think that this is a symptom really of, uh, of uh, I wouldn't say a failed engagement strategy because I think that many parts of our strategy in Libya uh, or our engagement there have been positive, but it is an unfortunate um, reality in 2015 uh, that we do not have an embassy there, uh, that many, many countries do not have embassies there, and that uh, more than that, we have, um, we have seen a, a broader disengagement of uh, the journalistic class and others who would, who would be uh, in a position to provide us with, with meaningful information. But that said, um, let me get into some of the uh, questions that were posed to me by uh, the team here at CSIS. And I think very, very rightly, they've, they've focused on, um, uh, on what we can do to know more about the political context that exists today and where it might go. What we understand to be the, the sort of broad uh, outlines of violent extremism in Libya and then some of the more specific natures of different organizations that we would put into that category. And also what uh, both of those um, trends uh, say and, and mean for the broader security environment in, in the region. Um, when it comes to where we are today in Libya, I like to talk about the, uh, the various conflicts that have existed in the country since the revolution uh, by dividing the period of time that, we've, that we deal with into two main uh, components. And in the first phase, I think we... The, I'm sorry, the 2011 revolution in, uh, in, in Libya. Um, the first phase, I think, was defined and extended up through 2013, middle to late 2013, and was defined by what were largely backward-looking conflicts. Um, the remnants of a revolution that still had uh, uh, a fair number of regime supporters uh, present in the country, and if they weren't present, they were certainly believed to be present by many of the uh, many of the security actors in the country at the at the. Uh, in the immediate post-revolutionary phase. And in that phase of conflict, uh, there, it was, I would say, defined largely by a sense of optimism that the various competing actors in the security sector in particular, but also in the political uh, arena, um, they, they looked out at the challenge of building a new state from, from a perspective of optimism, mainly because I think people during that time felt like the state had enough resources at its disposal that it would eventually be able to make all the competing claims to uh, influence and resources whole in the in the fullness of time, um, and so that was a very that was a very constructive phase. I think uh, there were problems, um, but what we saw in terms of um, demilitarization of certain actors that came out of the revolution, uh, as well as uh, a number of different political um, uh, compromises that were very important for stability during that period, we, we, had a, we, we looked at a very positive uh, context at the time. In, in 2013, particularly in late 2013, the phase shifted to, the conflict phase I think shifted to one where um, people were no longer as, uh, confident that the state would be able to um, divide up resources fairly, or at least in the ways that various groups hoped that they would be divided up. Um, security sector actors became far more politicized. Um, and the conflicts themselves were far more open-ended. People uh, and armed groups in particular were concerned about their future roles in the country and the level of influence that they might be able to obtain. Um, and so the, what we had then in 2014 with the uh, the, the clashes in Tripoli, 
Um, and now what we have in terms of a, of a highly polarized, uh, factionalized uh, country and, in, and set of institutions and actors inside of it, um, it is something of an entirely different nature and something that I think is far more concerning. Um, as you talk about the, you know, what happens today, uh, I think it's important to, uh, to, to sort of take as units of analysis, if, if, I, can, if I can use that term without, um, without causing too much laughter, um, but to take as, as your units of analysis the, the political, the security sector, and the development tracks. Um, in the beginning, uh, immediately uh, following the revolution, I think we had a very, very good, very close uh, correspondence between those uh, three different tracks. Um, you saw, I think, uh, a, a gradual uh, coalition of political interests, even as um, two very different uh, political groupings, mainly uh, uh, the Tahallaf and the Adala Wabanat, uh, parties, even even while those parties express very different, I think, uh, objectives. Uh, in the end, they were um, they they fully believed in the state building project, and they were willing partners with one another in, in making institutions uh, making institutions respond to a new kind of uh, political reality in Libya. Um, that went along with, I think, a lot of uh, a lot of confidence, if not actual. Um, uh, progress on the ground, but a lot of confidence in the development agenda that the state had at the time. Um, there was a budget surplus. People felt that uh, there was enough money coming out of the oil sector uh, to, to do very many great things in the country with respect to infrastructure and services. Um, and, and so there was a great deal of confidence there, and the ministries in Tripoli, as well as some of the local units of government around the country, I think were working, again, with that sense of optimism that they could make development happen in ways that it had never happened before. And then in the security sector, it was fascinating to watch how uh, immediately after a, a massive uh, revolution involving thousands of people and, and uh, quite a lot of violence, by summer of 2012, um, and Najla, you can say later if you agree with this, but by summer of 2012, it was remarkable to see that very many of the armed groups had stowed away their arms and the, and the, and the daily sort of ostensible presence of military groups in the streets um, uh, went away for the most part. Um, all of that is different now. Uh, we've, those, whereas those things were in phase back in 2011, 2012, they've become wildly out of phase today. So for example, um, the, 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 the sort of marrying of politics and security uh, has come apart completely. Um, to the extent that you can describe uh, political movements still uh, active today in Libya, if you go back to um, talking about the Tahallaf and uh, the Adala Wabanat movements, these would be, broadly speaking, the liberal and uh, the more conservative movements in the political arena. Um, those movements have uh, fallen very, very uh, deep into obscurity as the security actors in places like Tripoli, Benghazi, Sirt, and others um, uh, have risen to prominence. And so when you, when you try to think about how a dialogue process, for, for example, might bring those things back into phase, it's very, very difficult to imagine progress in Morocco, for example, this week, when you have uh, parties who, who are represented on uh, uh, two uh, different governing councils, the GNC and the, and the uh, House of Representatives, those parties are no longer um, possessed of the same kind of influence over the armed actors in places like Tripoli and Benghazi, Misrata and others. And so their capacity to do a deal is actually, is actually much lower. And meanwhile, the, the idea that the country might be able to um, uh, move itself forward or move these agreements forward using as, um, as uh, pieces of influence the, a development agenda, uh, that I think hope is, is uh, very, very diminished at, uh, in, in 2015 as well, only because we've seen the total collapse of institutions capable of, of using 
uh, Libya's considerable resources to make differences uh, in, in terms of infrastructure and services. So, so the idea that you could recreate the same sense of optimism and teamwork that existed in 2011, 2012 is, is I think, a very, a very distant one. And it, um, it is very difficult for me to sit here today and wonder how all of this might be uh, uh, put back together and in, into, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 a credible way forward. Um, we, we, I would enjoy talking more about exactly what is happening today in terms of negotiations in, in Morocco, in uh, places like Algeria and others. Um, but basically, I feel like we're dealing with a problem now that is, is going to be very difficult to solve using uh, the same sets of institutions and actors that we've been dealing with for the last two or three years. Um, if you move to the side a little and take uh, the question of violent extremism um, as, as a sort of subset of the conflict that exists today in the, in the political space and also in the security space, um, it's interesting to see exactly how uh, Libya represents it, um, uh, I, I would say a slightly different profile when compared to other countries in the region where, where those violent extremist groups are concerned. Um, no question we've had a problem of extremism in Libya since the very conclusion of, of the revolution and, and the, um, the attack on the American embassy or the American consulate in, in Benghazi is certainly uh, the, the, the most prominent example of how that extremism had manifested up till that time. Um, but it's very difficult to uh, see uh, major correspondences, I think, between the organizations like Ansar al-Sharia in Libya um, and how they, uh, the, the, their path forward might resemble or not resemble uh, what we see happening in Syria and Iraq, for example, with, with uh, the, the ISIS movement. Um, the, the conflict that uh, has come out into 2015 is one that is still dominated, I think, by uh, organizations competing claims to legitimacy across the country. And that includes violent extremist organizations or organizations that we might call violent extremists, um, Ansar al-Sharia being the most prominent among them, but others like Abu Slim, Martyrs Brigade, uh, the Libyan uh, Islamic Army in Darna, and now uh, to some extent uh, the, the organizations that have aligned themselves with ISIS. Um, we might take those organizations in Sirt and Darna that have aligned themselves with ISIS as exceptions, but the, the broader movement, I think, if you include Ansar al-Sharia and, and some of the smaller organizations, is one that still tries to appeal daily to, um, to everyday citizens as legitimate, uh, as legitimate political actors. And so the, the, the way forward, I think, in, in, uh, in terms of violent extremism in Libya will be one dominated by a kind of uh, ebb and flow of these organizations' ability to bring local populations over to their side. It will not, I think, be, um, it will not be, the, the, the problem of violent extremism will not be one dominated by, by ISIS-like ISIS, uh, ISIS groups, if only because those groups will have a very hard time in most cities around the country bringing over people to their side uh, and, 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 and bringing them over in a, in, a, in a political sense, I would say, in particular. Um, so we, as I think, um, I think as we look at organizations like Ansar al-Sharia, we really have to look at them as, uh, as uh, problems that, that extend out of the lack of services and infrastructure that is being provided by the state in places like Benghazi. And if those uh, problems can be addressed uh, reasonably in the future by a, 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 a unified government of some kind, I think that we'll see you know, a, a dramatic reduction in the influence of those kinds of organizations across the country. Um, if we talk about ISIS in particular, um, I think I, the, the advent of ISIS surprised us all. Uh, it, it, uh, is no surprise, perhaps, that ISIS appeared first in places like Sirte and Darna, which were so far from uh, the the reach of uh, central institutions, and 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 so long abandoned by any form of formal security uh, uh, following the revolution. Um, the fact that uh, we've seen, I think, um, 
we've seen an internationalizing, uh, you know, attempt in places like CERT. The appearance of uh, Sheikh Ben Ali from from Bahrain, who is a leading ISIS uh, theologian, there in CERT uh, a few weeks ago, is trying to rustle up sort of local uh, local recruits is something that would suggest, you know, that that ISIS really does have a play in the country. Um, whether or not that play is something that can survive the attention of militia forces in Misrata, I think is, is uh, somewhat questionable. Uh, we've seen debates in Misrata over the last couple of weeks swirl around whether or not they need to, con they need to sort of maintain the, the presence that they have in Tripoli and in the south, and to some extent Benghazi, or whether they should turn their attention to organizations like ISIS, uh, insert. And the result of those debates has been uh, to a large extent that, that the attention should be turned to the problem of, of ISIS uh, and a more virulent strain of, of violent extremism. Um, I think that's encouraging, um, but I think that the central problem it raises is one of, you know, how we all as an international community and how Libyans themselves define those organizations in Misrata that, uh, that are driving most of this, um, most of this uh, fight in, in places like CERT. If those organizations are uh, considered as, uh, by all of us in the international community and locally, as, uh, as ultimately part of a future Libyan state um, and, and, and constructive elements in at least part of the security uh, framework in Libya today, then I think we'll see um, a, a successful pushback against organizations like ISIS. If they continue to be uh, sort of marginalized in the, in the state building process going forward, and if, if the international community can't come to terms with what uh, a more conservative, although not by any means extremist strain of, of uh, Islamism in these organizations, uh, if we cannot come to terms with how that uh, fits into a, a state going forward, then I think there's going to be, th th there will be many problems in, in manifesting a large enough, uh, 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 coherent enough push against ISIS to, to really overcome the problem. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'll let Najla talk and, and fill in, uh, I think, um, uh, some, of the, some of the questions that are more socially relevant. And, and maybe talk a little bit about Benghazi, too, and, and where it sits today. Thank you, Hunter. Thank you, Hunter. Um, thank you, Thomas, for this opportunity. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Najla Mangouche, uh, originally from Libya, Benghazi, and uh, I just came here to the U.S. Uh, 2013. So I've been part of the conflict, and we work together um, in, in different activities with Hunter and the civil society. Um, so I think I'm going to focus more about uh, just highlight the history of Libya, uh, try to just focus on specific drivers for that conflict, because uh, the importance of highlighting or uh, the, those indicators actually to understand why we have this current crisis now in Libya. Uh, uh, so, I'm going to go, I don't know how I'm going to do that, I'm sitting, but, I'm sorry, let's, yeah. um, so, sorry, so here as you see in the slides, I'm, I'm going to just very fast go and try to analyze some uh, drivers in the Libyan conflict uh, to just have initial thought, uh, ideas about the history of Libya. So what are the indicators, as I mentioned, that were present during the early days in the Libyan revolution that we could prevent, actually, uh, from this current crisis? Here is a very complicated map, but uh, it's really make a lot of sense when you look to the... So here, actually, in the green, where we have this actual dynamics, the legacy of dictatorship and colonizations for a long time. We have 42 years from dictatorship. Before that, we have colonizations, Italian colonization, the British. Before that, we have the Turkish. So really, we have a long history of colonizations. And then we have this short period of the kingdom era. And then we have a dictatorship, Gaddafi, for 42 years. One of the five drivers, actually, we have political vacuum, Gaddafi loyalty, fragile institution, lack of power sharing, and evolutions of weak security and justice. 
And when you see to those drivers, actually they overlap and they actually, uh, you know, interconnect together. It's so difficult actually when you see what kind of problems that we have now. Uh, and actually we have even since the revolution started. So the revolution when it started in February 2011 was actually sparked and make those drivers more obvious to the people. But we, during that time, which is really interesting, we wasn't actually aware about what's going on. We, th we was really, um, the revolution was the revolution of people. We were, was optimistic. We were trying actually to work uh, as a civil society, but we ignore all that issues that we already have. Um, so, I'm gonna just highlight very quick the lack of power sharing and political vacuum and also the security because I feel three of them is so important and I feel those are the reasons actually for the global uh, you know, tourism and extremists that we have now in Libya. So for example, from the early days we have exclusion uh, from, for specific groups. And if you remember, Hunter, like the NTC from the beginning was the idea we want to work with specific people who will tr will worth trust, which is really understandable. But that mentality actually keep, they, they, they dealt with the same mentality until today, where they exclude some groups of people and just work with specific groups of people. And the criteria was we want just people trust them, we want people, they, they, they never work with the Gaddafi regime before. And after that, the GNC, the, the General National Congress in 2012, uh, 12, they actually uh, promote, uh, they, sta uh, they promote law, it's called political isolation law, where everybody actually worked during Gaddafi, Gaddafi era since uh, 1996, till the revolution prohibited to work in any public, you know, uh, or political, uh, uh, you know, uh, positions in Libya. So that really creates a lot of conflict instead of bringing the people together. Uh, they cancel that, that, this law this year, but the question will be how are we gonna change the mentality of the people and how really we create the idea of how we can work together instead of exclude each other, uh, especially if we want to think about uh, the future of Libya. Resisting feedback and uh, rashness of elections and lack of leadership I'm gonna also give example about the rashness of elections because really I feel so crucial, so important because what happens, Libya have really successful election process and you will be surprised uh, compared to the security crisis that we have. And it was really successfully, it was really uh, you know, promising um, and everything went perfect. But what's the result? We have six now uh, temporary government since the revolution started in 2011 until today. And this government don't have leg legitimacy, even with those people being elected. So where is the problem here? When you rush the election, you have winner and loser. And when you have loser, those losers should be reconciled and should be part of the process to build the country. So that election actually bring more conflict and uh, show failure actually in the, in the Libyan uh, experience today when we have those different governments. And to explain more a little bit about the government, so we have now two parliament, one located in Tobruk in the east and one located in Tripoli and we have two government and we have extremal groups and we have also uh, international interference. Security and justice, um, police dispowerment, actually it's a big, huge is issue, uh, absence of strongest institution. I'm a lawyer, I work for four years uh, in the legal system, and then I work as a professor in, in criminal law. It was really corrupted and uh, a lot of uh, legal issue that we dealt with uh, during that time. One of them actually, Gaddafi create uh, you know, um, mentality where people don't respect the police or the legal institution. Uh, he disempower them. There is no training, no weapons, no power. They can't actually control anything. The idea, just envision you can see policeman in the street where he can't actually stop you, stop you or try actually to suit you because he don't have enough power for that. And he did that for a reason. He wanted to disempower those legal system and actually uh, uh, disempower the idea of the rule of law. So that's actually, we, we, we have now this problem until today. 
definitely we have, you know, uh, proliferations of weapons everywhere, and that happens from the beginning of the revolution. I remember in 2011, we have just one military base in Benghazi. It's called Fadil Abu Amar, and it takes just maybe two or three days, and then they take over this, uh, this uh, you know, military base. Since that day, we have a huge number of weapons uh, distributed in the city, and that was actually the beginning, because Benghazi was the first city liberated in the east, and after, uh, you know, eight months, uh, we've been controlled also Tripoli. Military actually also without resources, this is a big issue in Libya. And I need to highlight that a little bit because it's so important now to understand the military role in Libya, uh, especially when we have now the dignity movement against the Dao movement. We want to understand that really because there's a huge debate in the Libyan society now about the role of the military. People, some of them, they don't trust the military, especially in the West. And some of them, they really passionate about the military ideas. And let me go back a little bit to the history of Gaddafi. Gaddafi actually um, tried to, to have different approach in the East and the West. So because we have a long conflict of a history of conflict between the East and Gaddafi, so Gaddafi, one of the things he tried to do, there is no military base in the East, and there is no training or resources to the military. He, he can't trust the military as institution because he was concerned about those military one day will maybe coup or maybe try to, to, to take over Gaddafi regime. So there is no military base, and, and, and in the beginning, he tried actually to push the militaries uh, in very failures war, for example, the war between Chad and Libya. Uh, he killed a lot of people who tried to stand against them. Um, uh, so he tried to disempower the idea of military also in the East. On the other hand, in the West, you can see, because he was based in Tripoli, so he have his own uh, you know, security, uh, uh, security service where those were well trained, very skillful, uh, have resources, and they was you know controlled by his uh, family and his sons. So he created this military base in Tripoli where have and those military actually they done a lot of crimes against uh, the people in, in Tripoli and the West. So just put that in your in your in, in your in your mind for a while, and then think about why we have division now today in Libya between the, the East and the West, well, by people supporting dignity and others. So when you see the, the East, let's say 90% in Benghazi, they're supporting dignity movement. And I will explain the, re the reasons later. But for, for the West, when it comes to the idea, to the military, everybody uh, have his, is suspicious about uh, Hefter uh, military and uh, the idea of the military in the East because they feel that th those will be actually just extensions of the, you know, uh, the human right violations uh, and the history they have been through in the West. Okay, so what are the current positions for Libya right now? We have negotiation process, as Hunter mentioned, start January 15. The UN initiated talk, uh, initiated talk and then actually try to gather those conflicted governments and uh, parliament in Libya, uh, which is amazing. And I, I feel it's a promising step, but really I have a lot, of, uh, a lot of criticism in terms of the process, how it's looked like, and, and how really we make sure that we can use this negotiation process as a rep mom moment that really can help uh, the future of Libya. Um, So, so when the negotiation process starts in January 15, in January 19, they decide to have ceasefire and was the goal to stop the violence between uh, the extremists and the dignity movement. After two days, they preached the ceasefire. And until today, we have this uh, so they initiate the talk in Geneva, and then in, in, in Morocco, and then Algeria, and then they're gonna uh, start again in Morocco. What really those people, the, the process missing from the beginning, there is no public participation with the negotiation process. It's top-down approach where really there is there is disconnect between uh, the grassroots level and between uh, you know the elites and the government. And especially those elites, if they had, don't have political will, it would be so difficult, and you don't have social foundation to support this negotiation process, then it would be so difficult to have successful uh, negotiation. 
And what I'm trying to suggest here, the grassroots actually should start the conversation, start to talk about and ask harder questions about what we need as a Libyan now today, how we can approach you know, the negotiation process, what's our role, are we ready really to, to you know, uh, think about ceasefire and why it's important for us as a Libyan. And from the international community, actually, we need a lot of support. And I believe insiders should be do, do the hard work in terms of the conversation and try to engage with the armed groups. But I believe also the international community have really a tremendous role to support the negotiation, not even just the negotiation, but the peace process in general in Libya. So, you know, they can do that politically and practically and by capacity building. Uh, they, they can influence actually the government and those armed groups to come to the table by in sanctions, incentives, you know, uh, processes, uh, trying to use political pressure. Uh, practically, need, we need actually for the international to uh, play a role to, you know, also use the pressure on the spoilers who, uh, who are, you know, from different countries. Qatar, you know, Emirate, um, uh, yeah, Qatar, Emirate, Turkey, they have many countries that really play now a role to uh, support part uh, against the other. And also we need capacity building. And, and you know, all, most of the embassies now closed in Libya, there is no financial aid. Uh, and, the, and, and, and I understand that because of the security crisis, but again, how we can support the civil society there, how can really we help those people to, to start the conversation without training, without financial support, without at least we have the, we want the basic of skills of facilitation negotiation to build the trust and the confidence with the civil society to be able to start the conversation with the armed groups. Uh, I love this picture because really I feel Yes, the negotiation process is considered rep repness moment, but also in Libya we need cultivated. We need to culti cultivate that. We need actually to use the event of you and talk as a as a as a chance, as opportunity that can we work together and try to communicate together and think about what options that we have, scenarios that we have as a Libyan, how we can really stop that violence and think about the future of Libya. It's not easy, but it's, will be, it's really one of the things that we need to think about. And we need also to include everybody in the process. So when I think about that, just to make it more realistic, I'm thinking about key people who can really, for example, when you speak again about the civil society, when you speak about armed groups, because those people have been affected every day by the violence, and people tired of violence. You know, I, I was calling my father yesterday. That people really tired and affected by violence. No electricity, no gas, you know. Uh, schools have been closed for a year now. Children without school. The daily life is so complicated now in Libya. Uh, there is actually division in the social fabric between the Libyan by themselves because they mobilize, mobilized by those different groups. So we have people even against or with and had that really affect the life, the daily life. Um, so we need to think about alternative ways. We have key people, and I, when I think about key people, I, key, I think about the women, I think about the youth, and I think about the moderate religious, and also I think about the traditional leaders who play a huge role now to solve the conflict in Libya, especially with the absence of the legal system. How we can use those people actually to start the conversation and strengthen the foundation for the social fabric? That will be possible just depend on those key, key people. We need both. We need key people and we need more people to be mobilized to work together and, and try to make social political change in, in the Libyan society. Uh, this is the last one and, 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 and I think really the, the solution for Libya, how to own the process. If, and, and again, why I mentioned the civil society, the civil society actually uh, play a huge role since the revolution started in the beginning. I believe in civil society. I was work as the head of the public engagement unit for seven months as a volunteer, which is uh, considered one of the department for the NTC National Congress. Uh, and we did a huge and tremendous work. It's not me, the people was really fantastic. And and, and the, just the power of the civil society, how really we did a lot of activities, a lot of fantastic work. And I just, when I just go back and think about that hope and passion and power, how we can really actually keep going the same and try actually to, to you know, rebuild 
the the trust and the element of the trust within the civil society. So uh, again, why I'm focusing on that, the lack of political will as a part of the national leaders, we need to strengthen the social fabric and create solid foundation. Libya produced local leaders believing in nonviolent movement and inspire the community to make change. From local leader, civil society can pursue national leaders to change their behavior. Thank you so much. Where do the negotiations take place? Uh, now? Yes. So they have, uh, the next meeting will be in Morocco. Physically, we'll be in Morocco. Okay. Yeah. Where is that located? Morocco, the country. Morocco, the country. Morocco, not within Libya. Not in Libya, outside Morocco. Libya. Oh, in Morocco. Rabat. South of Rabat. Where is the GMC located? Okay. Uh, Actually, that's, okay. a, that's something I wanted to yeah. bring up. Is, is One thing that I think would be very helpful, and, and both of you have touched on it, is let's just define the basic players and their locations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. I, any one of you can, can jump on that. I mean, it, t it depends, again, whether you're talking about uh, political players or military ones. Yeah. Um, Let's do both. So the political players, uh, the, way that, uh, the way that I see it, Najla might see it differently, but the political players institutionally are bound up in uh, the GNC, the General National Congress, uh, which was first elected in the summer of 2012 um, and has since uh, extended its mandate. Um, it, the mandate it first expired in February of 2014. Um, and that was by, we could call it statute, that was by a, a constitutional uh, a document that was written up during the revolutionary phase. Uh, in the meantime, another uh, parliament was elected, this was uh, last summer, uh, and it, it refers to itself as the House of Representatives, uh, and it is based in, in Tobruk uh, and in Baida to some extent, which are two cities in the east that are relatively secure. Um, so institutionally, you're talking about uh, two parliaments. You're also talking about two governments. Um, uh, Omar Hassi is, is serving as sort of the chief executive in the West, in Tripoli. Um, and you have uh, Thini, who is uh, serving as prime minister in the East. Underneath that sort of superstructure, then, you have what I think is a fascinating situation. Um, you have ministries that are still functioning in Tripoli. Those ministries, though they are in Tripoli, do not necessarily correspond only with the General National Congress that is governing from Tripoli. Um, across the sort of ministry landscape, you find different responses to the question, sort of how do you, how do you go to work every day? What, what do you do? Who do you respond to? Um, you have some ministries that are more closely associated with one government or the other. But by and large, the response that I get from people when I ask that question is, we're trying to go to work and remain neutral uh, day by day. Um, that is uh, especially important, I think, for all of us here considering what might happen in Libya next, but that is especially important for some very sacred cows in the Libyan context. One is the central bank, all right? Because the central bank is the one that pays, first of all, uh, the salaries of, uh, of just about what was the latest, uh, uh, Najla might know better than me what the latest uh, individual count was in terms of uh, public salaries, but the budgeted amount for public salaries in the country is right near $22 billion, right? And the central bank is the, is the, uh, the, the waypoint by which all of that money winds up hitting the street. And if those salaries aren't paid, um, Libya would be in, in a much different place today than it, than it is right now. So the central bank maintains that, that degree of, of independence. And other institutions like the National Oil Company, uh, uh, the Ministry of Finance, uh, these institutions all have to maintain, in my view, they all have to maintain this sense of independence if there's going to be any modicum of security going forward. So, so we can consider this sort of ministry landscape as, as a kind of detached, um, operational to some extent, but a detached uh, governing structure. And when I say operational to some extent, what I mean is, you know, as I said before, the development track is way out of phase at this point. There, there, when you talk about capital investments in the country, there's virtually nothing happening, right? Which, which in one sense is, is a, a, a big problem. In another sense, it's what I think is causing there to be uh, a great deal of, of um, what do I want to say, but a great deal of reticence in, uh, on the street to, to, to really uh, 
to, to really expand the conflict, right? Because there's just not that much money being spent across the country. So there aren't that many opportunities for people to perceive unfairness, slights, you know, whatever the, whatever the case may be. What they are doing, though, the ministries in general, they are paying salaries to uh, government employees, to the employees of government-owned businesses, uh, and, and, and to others, and those salaries um, are, I th you know, to, again, to my mind, those salaries are what are holding the country together at this point. Anything to add on that? I agree. Yes. Great. Excellent. Okay. Um, we will open it up to questions. I have several, but uh, we have a good crowd here today, so let's, uh, let's jump right to it. Okay. Bill, and, and please uh, make sure you use the microphone, Bill. Thanks. And identify yourself and your I'm Bill Sessions. Where do they physically meet when they come to negotiate? Is it over in the east, or is it in the west, or how do they get together? Is it congressional? Uh, who sponsors it? What happens? Thank you. This is a very good question. They didn't do any negotiation process in Libya. So the first meeting was in Geneva, in Switzerland. Uh, so they try to invite people from the parliament. Both east and west. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And also from uh, the, the west, from Tripoli. And then they follow this meeting with other meeting in Algeria, in Morocco, and then they went to Algeria. So every time they meet, they try to extend more people uh, to make sure they, they're more representative. And those people go back to Libya and try to have conversation with their groups or with their party, and then they go back to continue the negotiation process. What is the seat of government? Is it Tripoli? Is it Tobruk? Where is it? Sorry? What? Where is the seat of government? That, Where that's, yeah. that's actually the problem. It's in both places. It's in both it's in places. Both places. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so when they meet, they don't meet. One but, is internationally recognized. Okay. But I uh, just, just let me clarify one point here. So the, the, the elected you know, body, it's the parliament in the Tobruk. This is, they, they win by election, you know, legal election. And then because the security crisis was in Benghazi, so in the, in the beginning of the, in, written in the constitution, that they should actually have the parliament in Benghazi. So this is the main conflict. When they, when they have, the, 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 the security was a big issue and, and still in Benghazi, then they decide actually to choose Tobruk because it's safer and close from Egypt there and they can control it. So they went there, and from this story, the conflict start because some of the, the members of those parliament refused to go to Tobruk and say, no, we need to meet in Benghazi or Tripoli. So some of those group, group actually stay in Tripoli. They refused to meet there in the parliament. And from there, the crisis happens because they start mobilizing people around them, and then they say, we need to have our own parliament and our own you know, government. So this is just explained. There's another important point here, which is that um, the, the, the sort of UN track of negotiations is happening, uh, and as Najla said, it's sort of, it, they've made attempts to organize uh, dialogue inside the country in Ghadamas, for example. Those attempts haven't been all that successful, so they've opted instead for international uh, venues. There's a separate track of negotiations that has been happening. Uh, it's a significant track. It's been happening largely in Algeria over the last, since about December. And what's interesting about that track is that it's, it's much more focused on personalities uh, and behind the scenes actors, right? So um, in Algeria, you'll have, you had in December, you had uh, uh, Mahmoud Jabril and Salabi, who's a, a a, a religious figure that also ha commands a lot of influence among uh, some of the militias that are operating out of Misrata and, and Tripoli. You had them meeting for the first time in Algeria in an attempt to sort of cool the, the political fires that existed between um, uh, Mahmoud Jabril's group, which is the, the, the Tahalif group, the, the sort of so-called liberals, uh, and the, and the so-called conservatives. That, that track of negotiations has continued and, um, and, and, and is still uh, there's a, there's an open channel of communication in Algeria between uh, between the the figures that are at the head of some of the more potent uh, military organizations in the country, and those negotiations are also supported uh, in, in indirectly and directly by other regional actors to include Turkey and Qatar and uh, and and by extension or by implication also Egypt and the UAE. Yeah. That is, do they have an agenda where they're both talking, although separate, 
about the same things? I mean, that's very, uh, I think that, I think personally that there, the, the interests that are represented in those negotiations and, and when, what we're talking about then are, are the interests of the, the cities of Benghazi, of Misrata, of Tripoli, of Zintan, other, other influential localities across the country. I think it's fair to say that those actors are all interested in the state building process. Um, that's to exclude the extremist organizations that are that are fundamentally different. They have they have a totally different perspective on how a state should be should be built and over the long no term. There's no representation from them in the group that is meeting. No, no, there would be no. For example, there would be no Ansar al Sharia representation at these talks. Thank you, Bill. Yes, over here. Uh, my name's Nate Mason. I was the commercial attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Tripoli. 2011 to 2013. Uh, from the beginning, my sense has been that people are largely fighting uh, on the basis of a fear of exclusion from from whatever it ends up being the power situation, as opposed to having some sort of positive agenda, like we're fighting for Islamism or, you know, I, I think that that's sort of been misconstrued in the West. But do either of you, can you identify things that people are actually fighting for other than simply trying to avoid marginalization and exclusion at the end of whatever process? So, as Hunter mentioned, like the dynamic completely changed since 2011 till today. There is a lot of dynamics and uh, different factors. Um, I think the def I have a problem with the definition. So people, when they decide to do something under specific definitions, or it will be so difficult to clarify what's really that definition means to those people, you know? So when you see, it's so difficult also to say we are Islamist, we are Muslims country. And so the problem now with this new ideology now, people using actually the Islam as, as, as you know, uh, as excuse, but we know it's it's not the the you know the reality. It's just for political agenda, and they. So I think there's other reasons for people look for a definition they are really feel comfortable with, because they have their own needs, and I think the, those they, for example most of those youth they have problem with economic. They're looking for jobs. They're looking for uh, you know dignity. They they're looking for identity. Uh, uh, you know, um, others they use. You know, they are less education than the others, so 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 easy for them to mobilize those youth for different reasons. And the beginning was for to just to fight against Gaddafi, but after that, you know, we actually uh, also forget about the trauma issue with those militia groups who have been involved. And in, since the you know the revolution, it was civil war. Actually, it wasn't revolution. So how that really affect you know the way how those militia see themselves and how they keep continue today, uh, I think this is, will be the question. I don't know if I answer your question. And Nate, what I would say is, is that you're exactly right, that um, it, it's much more a question of being excluded than it is a question of fighting for sort of, uh, you know, an Islamist uh, way of governing. Uh, to what, and what that means, I think, is very, very uh, open for discussion, even among the organizations that are commonly identified as Islamists. But when you say excluded um, and, and fighting, a, you know, in defense of one's inclusion in government, what we're really, I mean, what's so important to understand about Libya is that the revolution at the beginning was experienced very individually by, by different towns across the country. And the militarized response to uh, that revolutionary context was different in every community. And the militias that we see now today are, to a large extent, born of that, of that context, right? So um, Misrata experiences the revolution in a very, very brutal kind of way. Uh, and, and the city is forced to uh, raise up a huge number of neighborhood defense forces that, uh, that, that you know, are, are capable of, of protecting the town from a, a, a very serious onslaught by the regime. Well, yes, I mean, the, 
the, the, no formalization has ever come to the security sector in Libya since the, the conclusion of the revolution. Even those forces like um, the, what we hear are the state special forces in Benghazi, that's, that, that's just another militia acting in a very ambiguous space. But what I'm saying is that when we're talking about exclusion, we're talking about the exclusion of localities and their future uh, role in, in the state. Um, and it's important that we understand that you know an, a, a city like Misrata might feel threatened or might feel uh, paranoid about its future role in the state, uh, because that means that the solution to the the current political uh, crisis is one that has to uh, fundamentally deal with with localities. In my in my opinion, some people would will will argue that that, that uh, the tribal influence is strong. Some people will argue that um, perhaps that there's a, a a religious element that is powerful um, for some uh, powerful motivating factors for some of these groups, but I I really think that what we're what we're talking about is the competing interests of of municipalities and localities across the country. And when you talk to people uh, when you talk to people these days, uh, I think it's strongly felt across the country that a, a a possible alternative to the negotiations that are happening in Morocco right now between the parliaments is to take what exists at the local level, civil, um, sorry, municipal councils, uh, and use municipal councils and their connections to civil, so uh, civil society organizations on the one hand, security organizations at, a, at the other, to negotiate a, f a, a, a sort of uh, a, a final status for, for, for government going forward, um, or interim status for government going forward. Uh, unless we're able to kind of deal with that um, that fundamental reality that that cities matter. I don't think we're gonna we're gonna come up with uh, a successful negotiation strategy. Thank you for your question. Um, I think w one of the obstacles that we have, again, because the division. So how really you, you try to encourage the people to think outside the box? How really you, you take this emotional have been involved with that? The problem with Libya, and let me speak about Benghazi again, because really the, uh, what I can notice since I left, there is really a division between the society now, between against black or white. Either you are with dignity or even you are with down. And I think the reason, reason for that, because people involve with, with those, uh, you know, with those dilemma directly. So every family you have husband or, you know, brother or, you know, friend or neighbor, they are involved either way with down or with dignity. So I think there is interest here is happening within the family themselves. So really how we can actually challenge that and try to bring the people who, and I believe the by, bystanders, because also the civil society, the problem with civil society, there have been a lot of civil society, they're supporting dignity, for example, you know, and most of them, they support dignity. And that really dangerous when it comes to the, you know, how you build the, the element of trust, because people, they are not going to listen to you, especially the armed groups, if they feel you are against them or you are having a side. So how you present yourself, how you select the right people, and how to you know, uh, develop training for those people. I'm happy to, to hear like the UN and the US, 
uh, thinking about that, but as as far as I know, like I have good relationship with the civil society there. There is no there is no training happenings to the civil society in the ground. We have two million people now outside the region in Tunisia and flee from uh, you know flee from the conflict. And I, I was thinking uh, talking with one of my friends why we can't try about alternative uh, approach where how train those people and then they can go back or try to communicate with others in the region but also the challenge now with the security. So how we can start with the conversation secretly with small groups where they can actually build this foundation and this social fabric within the community and then they can actually have this foundation for uh, all of the whole region, you know. So I, 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 so far I know there is no funding happenings now or work in Libya. It's very few, like they're just trying to ending some project, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, especially in Benghazi, like there is no work have been done there and all the time the excuse is the security. So how we can reach those people, how we can help them and support them, I think this is the question. It sounds like resources and scale and security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also I think that there's, there's a sad story to tell here in the sense that um, really we look at those, those the, the question of, of social engagement. I think we look at that question from the perspective of lessons that we've learned. Um, we failed, I think, to, uh, to invest uh, substantially enough in the early phase, um, and what, in, especially in, in places like Benghazi. We were there in the beginning. Uh, we, the international community, were there in the beginning. And when government, uh, Libyan government, moved to Tripoli uh, in, in the early fall of 2000, uh, 2011, uh, there was a huge sucking sound as, as all the engagement moved to the west. And suddenly Benghazi, which saw itself as sort of center of the world, you know, post-revolution, post you know this very well, um, looked around and said, w what the heck just happened? Uh, and where did, all the, where did all the interest go? And where did all the services go? And where did, and, you know, the city stuck by its guns, uh, and its guns were civil society at the time. Its guns weren't, you know, the, the various brigades and Ansar al-Sharia and the others. The city stuck by its guns for a very long time, it, 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 even beyond uh, the assassination of, of uh, Chris Stevens. Um, but after a time, it, the, the space where civil society could really make an impact was taken over by, by armed groups uh, that were just far more powerful. And today, uh, I think we don't get back to this position where we can deal with civil society in these constructive ways until there's some there's some deal done track one that that allows the security that allows people to have confidence in in the security environment and that brings back all these people who left because after all you know the 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 real key stitches to all this social fabric they've they've left the country now in the last six months to a year and that's a huge problem. What's um jump outside the country a little bit or look at some of the connections outside. Two questions I'd like to address. One, what is the impact and activity that Libya is having with the Sahel region? And let's look at that historically. Uh, we know that Gaddafi was meddling and causing a lot of trouble across Africa. But since the revolution, what's happened um, with a little bit look to the past? And number two, who are the regional players who are making an impact uh, kinetically as well as financially and otherwise in the region from the Emirates to Qatar to Egypt, Italy, others. Mm -hmm. If we could split those and yeah. take whatever one you want. I mean, the South in Libya is a fascinating place. Uh, it's very, very different from the rest of the country, very different. Um, what drives much of the South are uh, trading schemes, we, we'll just call them schemes for the moment. A lot of it is what you would call illicit trade, but a lot of it is, you know, trade that's existed for, uh, for decades, if not hundreds of years, um, and is, is just traditional. Uh, nevertheless, there is the, the, the subsidy regime in Libya allows opportunities for, uh, for very closed, very suspicious networks of, of traders um, to profit uh, to profit greatly by by taking things like refined fuel across the border into into places like Nigeria or sorry Niger Algeria and um, and Chad, uh, that's a problem only because in order to secure those closed trading networks, uh, organizations militarize, they come into close contact with one another, and they're inherently distrustful. Plus, there's a resource out there that everybody wants to control. Um, 
So what you have then is uh, in places like Subha and then the network of cities that extend out from Subha to the border, you have competition between these closed networks and largely that competition is, um, is, is sort of uh, separated or, or, the, or the, 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 the actors inside of that competition are separated by uh, ethnic lines. And, and parts of those, uh, um, you know, parts of those groups have been historically either supported or um, neglected by, by the regime. Um, so they, they have sort of historical antagonisms that are at play. Um, but when you talk about how those organizations uh, then impact a sort of broader regional um, concern about the flow of weapons and the flow of extremism and ideas, uh, it's difficult to get a handle on exactly what the risk is that Libya poses. Certainly the weapons are out there, and as long as there's a profit to be made, uh, they will flow. Um, whether the South and Libya represents a fruitful ground for, um, for you know, the building of extremist movements, I think is something that's a little bit more open as a question. Um, it, it's, it's not been the case uh, that, that I've been able to observe or that many of the people that I'm in touch with have been able to observe that you know, organizations like Al-Qaeda uh, and the Islamic Maghreb and others have, have uh, achieved a great deal of influence in the South in society. The problem, though, is that it's just a huge space. Uh, there's, you know, if there's, no, if there's no management of the security situation in the North, there's certainly no management of it in the South, uh, to include especially borders. And so there's just a lot of room um, for people to set up shop. And I think that's what uh, folks who, who might be based in Niger these days, looking North, the French, the Americans, others, uh, are concerned about, is that, you know, as to, to the side of what normally exists in terms of you know illicit trade and, and other kinds of troublesome things in, in southern Libya, to the side of that you do have uh, just a very large space that's open for, for groups to operate out of. Um, there are other implications to the sort of competition between tribal groups in the south that, that want to conduct trade, um, but largely I think those implications have to do with Libyan stability as, as a whole, not necessarily with, a, with a, a broader sort of regional impact. Najla, how about some of the neighbors? What are they up to? <laughs> this is so difficult, okay. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the slides, like about the, the rule of the international community, so um, Qatar actually played a huge role since the revolution started, and everybody was wondering in the beginning. I was one of the people, like, oh, okay, yeah, great, we want support, uh, we want like weapons to the revolutionaries. I was thinking like that in that time, um, but. Uh, later, we discovered that was actually for a specific agenda and especially for supporting the Brotherhood in Libya, where they're really actually based in the West in Tripoli, and they are behind that, you know, uh, the idea of having other parliament and other government. They have their own agenda and, or needs that really affect uh, the situation in Libya in general. Um, and also in Benghazi. Now people flee both, who was who was actually supported by Qatar, who support the the you know br brotherhood. They actually have been now fleed from the from Benghazi because they've been threatened. And also the people who against Qatar, like I have a lot of my friends, uh, you know, judge, lawyers, activists, for the same reason because they actually discover that there is a lot of influence and that creates conflict within the Libyan themselves. This is Qatar, e EU also play a role now, and uh, Egypt to support the Dignity Movement, which is the military. Um, in the East, they, 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 they seems like that support. In the West, they, they, they raise a question like they interfere in our uh, you know, local situation, in my, our country, we don't want anybody to be involved. Uh, Turkey actually also have the same situation like Qatar, she should support the Brotherhood. And um, both of them, Turkey and Qatar, they involve in the beginning of the revolution, the early days actually, they support and they did a lot of work, humanitarian work, and then after that we discover there is something else behind that. So I think they really, you know, play a role. And I, I wish if the international community like the US or the EU, or they really try to play a role where they can use the pressure to make balance and try not to actually support 
you know, part against the other because in the end we are Libyan and I think we need to think about the future, how we can work together. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, microphone and name and affiliation, please. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Ken Meyer, Court of World Docs. Uh, the, the, speaking of the international community, the uh, revolution was heavily dependent on NATO's intervention for its success. How would uh, a direct uh, military intervention by NATO be viewed today? I'll speculate and then Najla can give you the truth. Um, <laughs> I think in quite a few places it would be popular, to be honest. Um, Benghazi is sick of what has been uh, a very, very uh, long fight there. And uh, I think that um, the support for uh, an organization like Dignity, um, led by uh, Khalifa uh, Hefter uh, in Benghazi, is, is almost uh, weirdly uh, strong. I mean, the support for, for uh, a, a resurgent sort of uh, ex-Qaddafi general who's trying to bring over a lot of uh, Qaddafi-era military officers and, uh, and, and, and also tribes that had been formerly supported by the regime, you know, it, it's, it's not intuitively a, 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 an inherently smart uh, or an inherently popular uh, thing. Um, but nevertheless, Benghazi is is showing a great deal of support for the dignity operation, and and I think that you know that suggests really people are looking for any any uh, opportunity at all to stop the violence. Other parts of the country, it's obviously going to be uh, quite a bit more complicated. But um, the message that I get constantly from Libya is that look, there's consensus really at, at the at the base of it all. There's consensus about who the bad actors are. Um, and the bad actors aren't necessarily Dignity and Dawn. The bad actors are uh, organizations like Ansar al-Sharia, ISIS, and other sort of real extremist organizations. So if a fight was taken to those groups uh, by an international force, I think it would be largely popular. If the fight starts to expand to other uh, organizations, um, like uh, elements of the Dawn movement, which are, are the most commonly vilified, then I think it would be, uh, it would be a, a huge mistake. Yeah, I think I think the people uh, again, as I mentioned, tired from violence and really want somebody to take the initiative. We don't have capable government; they can stop the extremists. And the only way people see we we can actually solve the extremist problem now in Libya by have a strong military. They can actually can you know fight against the Islamist, the Islamist or the extremists. Um, and and as as Hunter mentioned, there is a lot of people they have some sort of ideas about Hefter and where he's coming from and his history, but they don't mind that person to take the initiative to lead this movement to, you know, to get rid of those extremists. Uh, again, I have my own personal, uh, you know, I, idea about, is that the right way to do fight against the, ex the extremists or try to think about other alternative ways where we can engage them and bring them to the table and instead of keep ignoring and trying to put those uh, terrorist group in, you know, in the list where they, we can't actually just name those as a terrorist group. It's a really huge problem because you actually decide to uh, close the communication with those group and just decide to fight them again. There, there's another point um, to be made here, which is that you know the the the, the problem that exists now, uh, the specific problem between Dawn and Dignity, was driven in a large part by uh, expanding the fight in Benghazi to actors that weren't sort of these consensus uh, bad guys. Um, Hefter, when the operation started in Benghazi, talked a lot in the English press, especially about his move against Ansar al Sharia. This was, you know, this was a, a very cut and dry issue of, of uh, Libyans taking action against uh, extremist organization in their midst. Uh, the actions, though, at the time didn't quite bear out that sort of limited uh, engagement. It was a much more broad uh, attack on other brigades in Benghazi that had uh, revolutionary credentials, that had connections to other parts of the country, and that really represented a different political uh, point of view uh, 
um, it, it, a different political point of view, not a, not a, a, a point of view that was opposed to the state building process, but one that was that was simply different than than what many people in in the East stood for. Uh, and so when that fight expanded to those other organizations, uh, their um, you know, you know, their network of supporters around the country became very, very frightened. And uh, the, the idea that uh, some of Hefter's allies were in possession of Tripoli Airport meant to these, these, these other people, mainly from Misrata, that, uh, you know, that the, the Hefter and his allies could begin moving uh, support weapons and other, and other uh, meaningful supplies back and forth between the East and the West. So the fight at the airport then erupted because uh, those interests in Misrata wanted to, to ensure that that wouldn't happen. And, and once the fight at the airport broke out, you know, it was a fairly uh, quick descent into, into the crisis that we have now. So, you know, when you talk about you know who who you're going to label as the bad guys and the good guys, you have to you have to be just you have to be very very specific. Otherwise, you, you're going to make this problem a whole a whole lot worse. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ben, please. So I'm with the Africa program here at CSIS. Uh, just on that. Um, you, know, you talked about a lack of discernment, and my question is, um, how do you, who are you referring to? I mean, is, is it seems that Hefter is benefiting a bit from making these his targets, and he has a lot of support from UAE, Egypt. Um, you know, how do the dominoes fall? Who do you push back on? You know, who's the person that changes the narrative to say, as you said, some of these people will be part of the national project and some won't, and it's important that we don't alienate some of these groups and lump them in with, uh, you know, other more problematic actors. So I'm just curious. If you're talking about how, you know, how does track one, in terms of the negotiations that are currently underway, how does track one resolve itself, right? Um, I think the biggest impediments to that track achieving a, revo uh, a resolution are uh, Hefter on the one hand, literally the person himself and, and sort of uh, the, the immediate um, group of people around him. Uh, and, and then on the other side, there are, you know, for lack of a better word, there are warlords uh, who, who operate out of Misrata, Eastern Tripoli, and, and, uh, and other parts of the country who, who probably also need to step aside in, in a way before there can be any real political compromise. But that said, um, it seems pretty clear that interest on all sides political interests, at least, are interested in coming to a compromise in the very near future. My concern is that those political interests, again, are out of step with the military interests. Uh, and it's not at all a straightforward thing to say, you know, that that dawn sort of corresponds to Muslim Brotherhood, corresponds to Misrata. All of that is far more complicated than the, than the, the simple story that's often told. Uh, and and so then I think you know you wind up if you're trying to find a place where the security, the political right, and um, and to some extent even the, the the development tracks align themselves, it's at the 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 municipal level in most cases today. And so for example in Misrata, the the municipal council, which was after all elected, has now taken sort of oaths of fealty from dozens of the brigades in that city who are also part of the Libya Dawn movement, right? Uh, this intermingling of interests is uh, is a huge problem because we, from the outside, need to have something in a in, you know in a five hundred word story to grip onto. Um, but the fact is that for the for the 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 track negotiations, what what we what we need to have happen is to find a place where those three things overlap, and then to describe them in, in enough with enough sensitivity so that we know exactly where the the interests. Uh, you know, lie and and then use those interests and the chips that we have at our disposal, limited as they might be, you know, to bring people to some kind of of, of agreement. Um, I think in, until we start uh, looking at those those smaller units and and this uh, those alignments of interest, we're not going to you know these talks are just going to kind of go on ad nauseum. Uh, and and the fact that you know political leaders might make commitments that military leaders can't back up or vice versa. 
you know, it, it's just going it, to it, it's just going to result in, in continued frustration and and a lot more fighting on the ground. I, I maybe I will flip the question if you don't mind and I see like we need to figure out what's the insider want you know I mean that there's really a influence but at least we need now as a Libyan to sit together and figure how we can really uh, make priority what, sh what kind of interest or need that we need and then when we have like this clear agenda that will be so easy to work with international community and say hey actually this is what the group's, you know, interest, this is what they need, and to, to make sure we have, like, a, at least clear strategy that the, the, the international community can support. Because when you say, no, I don't want them to interfere anymore within the Libyan, you know, context, or they are going to ask you this, the next question, why, what they want. No, actually, we want to support that, because, for example, Libya, uh, Egypt case, they support the down or the military, and their and, and their reason they they don't want extremists, and they don't want, and they are ha also have concern about the brotherhood. So, I feel it's it it's, it could be both. But my perspective, I think we should, as insider, as a Libyan, decide what we want to do with that conflict, and then try actually to think about how the international uh, community support that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and I, I think you know, there's it, it's no secret that you know there's a, there's a massive struggle underway across the Middle East right now between supporters of organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood and 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 people that oppose that. Um, you, you know exactly how the the international actors are going to compete for that kind of influence in Libya. I think is a, is an always evolving story. It was fascinating to watch, for example, the Watan Party in Libya, which which ran in the initial elections uh, back in 2012, as a sort of explicitly, uh, you know, it was an organization that was explicitly supported by Qatar, um, and. And that was known uh, across the country, and because that was known, the party, which you know, you would you, you would driving around, right? You would you would think that the, the party was doing very well because they were certainly the best resource in terms of you know posters and and you know all the the sort of material of, of an election campaign. Um, but they they polled what one two percent maybe across the country, and I think it largely because they were they were known to be supported from abroad. So I think there's there's a huge sort of level of angst at this point in the country about any kind of foreign uh, involvement, with the exception perhaps of again that ironic situation in Benghazi where you you have a, a, a large number or, or a big part of the population supporting. A, a movement that is that is very explicitly funded and aided by uh, by interests like Egypt's and and the UAE. So, um, you know, it, how this is all going to evolve in in the next six months in the context of negotiations, I, I actually, I you know, I, I couldn't really say, but I agree with with Najla that the you know th there there is a sort of native interest in um, in, in, in sort of expelling. At, at least as much as possible, the foreign influence, and if we can focus on some of those native interests, we're probably, you know, we're probably uh, on the right track. One more question from the crowd, Ed Soyster. Uh, Ed Soyster, old soldier, um, and this is a far out thing. Uh, as I look at the map, and the thrust of all the discussion is the division between east and west. Is there any thought of, in fact? dividing the country and going from there. Uh, 
Well, I was speaking to an uh, official at the central bank um, a couple days ago, and, and he, in fact, said the same thing. Uh, and, and he's speaking from the position of, a, of an utter nationalist. Um, you know, I, I think people are, uh, at the sort of social level, people are, are starting to talk about that more and more. Certainly in Tripoli, um, there is an attitude that the East is just far too troublesome to go on dealing with, and uh, maybe it's better if they just uh, handle their future on their own. Um, once that sort of bubbles up into the institutions, it gets to be a much more problematic thing, and, and how you would deal with the fact that most of the oil resources are in the East is just beyond anybody's ability to really ration through. But nevertheless, there are um, movements that have existed since the end of the revolution that have promoted different models of federalism um, with various degrees of autonomy for, for the different regions. Uh, those movements in initially were, were very unpopular, even in the East. Uh, but who's to say what influence they might have going forward? What what is happening, though, I can say is that um, you know uh, the the Thani government out of Tobruk is doing its damnedest to establish new institutions in the East that are that are you know they they're counterpart institutions to institutions in the West. There's a guy living in an apartment in Tobruk who's claiming to be the governor of the Central Bank of Eastern Libya. Um, there, there, there's a, a national oil company that's been established in the, you know, the, the sort of genesis of that kind of partition is there. I still personally feel like it's unlikely that we would see any real division, uh, but we'll see. I mean, at the end of the day, too, it's, it's, a, it's always important to remember that Libya is a tiny, tiny place. You know, you're talking about five, maybe six million people. Uh, it's a huge area, but a, but a very small place in terms of people's connections to one another. So as a guy who lived there for three years, uh, one year in Benghazi, two years in, in Tripoli, for example, you know, on an average day in Tripoli, I'd, I'd, I'd run into people on the street that I knew very well from Benghazi. And that's just the way the society sort of fits into itself. You know, it's hard to imagine, given that, that there would be a way to sort of pull apart into, into, uh, into constituent units. And more than that, um, I think you would, you, you know, you would, you would then have to deal with the fact that, you know, the East would be sort of a, a kind of a transitional state from Egypt's sort of sphere of influence and the West, maybe not quite as transitional, but still, you know, there, there would be, there would be a, an interesting character there that would change because it would just be a smaller unit up against, you know, two fairly significant states to the, to its own West. And the South would be, you know, God only knows. Okay. I just want to comment and, and, and Hunter, uh, you know, just added something. Again, Libya is so tiny, and, so, and, and, and and personally, I find so difficult to to you know think about the division uh, idea. Uh, my father from uh, Musrata, I grew up in Benghazi, and my mother from Tripoli, and we are really small, you know, group of people. We're really interconnected socially, and 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 under different tribes, and I think it's. We, uh, for me, it's so difficult to think about that, you know. And yes, there is a lot of frustration now in the street because people they feel, especially, they suffer too long, especially in the eastern Benghazi, under those extremists, and they feel they there is no enough support from the West. Especially, they have different, you know, agenda with this new parliament and government. But again, I feel from the people perspective, I don't think so. That would be a good idea. I don't know, people. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. Thank you for your question, Ed. Uh, since December 2010, we've seen a succession of governments fall. Tunisia, uh, Libya, Egypt, Yemen, we've had a civil war ongoing. In Syria, there was a lot of promise that was offered to people and then a lot of unmet expectations and a lot of instabilities. We've seen Libya is an excellent example of it. I think the public is confused about what's going on there. Uh, we just don't know a lot of uh, 
the differences between the players and the changes that go on day by day. So we really appreciate having you, Hunter, and Najla come in to provide some insight to us, and we hope you join us for the next meeting.